you're part of our service. We do have some announcements we'd like to bring to your attention, those who are watching online. I'd like to remind you that our bulletins are uploaded at the Granite Bay Church website. So if you'd like to stay in uh, touch with what's happening at Granite Bay, please visit the Granite Bay Church website. You'll be able to view the bulletins. They're usually uploaded on a Thursday afternoon. So a few things just to highlight. Of course, we're online church, so we encourage you to tune in uh, every Sabbath for both Sabbath school, which is at 10 a.m. Pacific time, followed by the worship service, which is 11 a.m. Pacific time. We also have a midweek Bible study, and we're still studying through the book of 1 Samuel. We're nearing the end of 1 Samuel, but that is broadcast live on Facebook, and that is the Granite Bay Church Facebook page, 7 p.m. every Wednesday. So we encourage you to tune in. Just a great time to study in depth into some of these great Bible stories in the Old Testament. I'd also like to remind you that your tithes and offerings can be given online. And to learn more about that, just go to the Granite Bay Church Facebook page. If you have a prayer request, and we know that there's a number of you that have prayer requests during this time, you can post your prayer request at the Granite Bay Church. And we do have a prayer ministry. And they share those prayer requests and they pray for them on a regular basis. Also something that I think you'd find helpful for those of you joining us online uh, if you'd like to get church updates, we send out an email every Thursday, and it gives you the update for what's happening that coming Sabbath. And if you'd like to get those church email updates, all you'll have to do is send us your email to office at granitebaysda.org, and we'll send you those Thursday uh, weekly updates. And then if you're tired of sitting at home during the Thanksgiving and you want to get some fresh air, uh, we're going to have a health ministries hike. I'm sure they're going to be keeping social distance, but they're going to be getting outside and doing some walking, and that's actually going to take place tomorrow. So the date for that is Sunday the 29th. It's going to be from 8 to 12, and um, they're going to be meeting at a nearby park. And if you'd like to be a part of that group, uh, please email, and the email is in the bulletin. It's health at granitebaysda.org. Let them know that you're planning on coming, and they'll be able to give you further directions to make sure that you get to the right place. And so that is our Thanksgiving hike. It'll be taking place tomorrow, Sunday, and you want to make sure you email to get the details. And then also for those who have the bulletins, you're looking online, you'll notice we have a second reading for transfers. These are folks who are transferring to different churches, some who have moved from our area, and we also have a number of people who are transferring into the Granite Bay Church. Now, under normal circumstances, we like to share a little bit about each of these individuals transferring in. We usually ask them to stand so as a church we can greet them. Things are a little bit different today, as you can imagine. But what we'd encourage you to do is, this is the second reading of names, so they've been in the bulletin for one week, and today is the second reading. We're going to go ahead and vote these individuals into the Granite Bay Church and also those who are transferring out. And for the few of you who are here in person, we're going to give you an opportunity to vote. Those of you who are members of the Granite Bay Church and you are watching online, um, we're going to assume your vote is positive uh, unless you contact me via email directly. Of course, you've had a week to ask any questions. So we would like to make these folks official as part of the Granite Bay Church. So having said that, we trust that you've had a chance to look through the names. Are we going to go ahead and take a motion to transfer the folks into the Granite Bay Church as well as those who are transferring out of the Granite Bay Church? And I'm looking for a motion. We see one. A second to that. Do we have a second? I see a second. Are all those in favor here in person, you can just raise your hand for our Granite Bay members. And of course, we're assuming you're raising your hand there at home. <laughs> if you have any questions about that, you're welcome to contact us here at the church office, and um, we can deal with that at that point. We'd also like to welcome those who might be visiting us online for the very first time. Maybe this is the first time you've tuned into the Granite Bay Church online service. We'd like to welcome you in a special way. And uh, we do have one or two visitors that are here in person. And again, we'd like to welcome you if this is the first time that you're here at the Granite Bay Church. And uh, we do have a gift that we would like to give you if this is your first time here. You'll notice in the seat back pockets right in front of you, there is a little visitor's card. And if this is the first time you're visiting, fill in the visitor's card following the church service. You'll be able to drop it off on the uh, table as you leave, and you'll be able to pick up your book 
your special gift that we have for you. And again, welcome. Thank you, those of you joining us online and also those who are here in person. Well, with that, we can invite you to stand and sing the call to worship. And so those of you who are here in person, you can go ahead and stand. And friends, if you're watching online, why not stand where you are and participate in our call to worship? It's that great anthem, We Have This Hope. And so we'll be singing it at this time. Almighty Father in heaven, Lord Jehovah, our creator, what a privilege it is to come into your presence this holy Sabbath day and to worship you, Lord. Uh, we thank you for all the blessings. We thank you, Lord, for the promise of the Holy Spirit that where we gather in your name, that you are there. Lord, I pray that you will speak to each person that is both here and those who are joining us online that you'll speak to their hearts and encourage them, that you'll minister to them through the power of the word, and that we can all be transformed, Lord. Uh, the, the miracle of the gospel will happen once again in our lives, and we become like Jesus, and we ask this in his name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Happy Sabbath to you all. It's nice to be able to be together as we continue to worship the Lord on this Sabbath day. We are just so thankful that we have the technology to be able to uh, gather together on a virtual basis as uh, so many of us are finding ourselves staying at home as we are uh, doing our best to be able to uh, slow the spread of this particular a virus and, and uh, pandemic time. So uh, it is good to be able to come together, at least virtually. Uh, we certainly look forward to the time when we can come together in a person. Um, and uh, so blessings to all that are watching online and uh, for the different people that are joining us in different ways here today as, as well. It is a beautiful day. I don't know about you, but one of the things that I started to learn as I opened the Bible as a new Christian is that, uh, and through the experience of God, is that uh, every day is an opportunity to give. And uh, on Sabbath, of course, it is a tradition of many of us. It's a regular custom and practice for us to be able to return our tithes, return our offerings as uh, we continue to acknowledge that God is the maker of all things. And uh, so uh, this particular month, our, our monthly uh, budget a goal has always been, or it has been for some time now, $35,000 uh, per month. I know that even though we aren't meeting in person with our brand new facility and church of worship that we have together here of service and outreach and such, uh, there are some very real expenses that are more pressing than they ever have been in our past so far as a Granite Bay Hilltop Church. And uh, so we just want to thank you for your faithfulness in uh, giving, and uh, we have uh, reached 31,000 of that 35,000 so far for this month. Uh, the regular pattern uh, over the last several months has been that we have been exceeding our monthly goal, and uh, so we just want to thank you as the pastoral team, the elders, board, uh, for your faithfulness in giving, and remembering that, uh, that there is a work for us to do, there is a work for us to finish, and God has given us that work to do. 
I also trust that you had a good Thanksgiving. I know that uh, there has been challenges that are very unique to this particular year's Thanksgiving, but I trust that it was positive and you were able to find something positive in your experience, uh, still be able to gather in whatever capacity with friends and family and, uh, and make a best of it. And remember that there's still much to be thankful for. Now, another tradition that comes with Thanksgiving here in the U.S., you know, I'm a, a more new to the American uh, uh, culture and country and so on as uh, somebody that was uh, raised in Canada, but uh, there's a very real tradition that I see and have experienced that's closely tied to Thanksgiving, and that is the day after Thanksgiving. And uh, any Black Friday shoppers out there? Uh, you know, I know that our family had experienced that a little bit yesterday. Uh, Denise and I are in desperate need of a new sofa in our main living room. And uh, so we went out looking and seeing if there's any uh, deals. Denise came back deflated. We went, looked at 100 sofas and we still didn't come home with one. Uh, but, uh, you know, we did find a, cred a credenza, I think it's called, for our family room. There's a dead space that we we're desperately looking to, uh, not desperately, but we were looking to fill. And, uh, and so we are uh, happy to be able to find something for that. I hope that you have found something. Uh, another thing that we also found was not something for ourselves, but we also found a number of Christmas gifts that we can give to others. And I know that's part of the tradition, I think, here uh, as well as we look at Black Friday shopping. You know, the verse that I'd like to share with you as we consider our returning our tithes and offerings today is uh, found in Acts chapter 20 and verse 35, where Paul is letting us in on a very important golden uh, statement of counsel that is only recorded and given to us through Paul. And he says, remember the words of the Lord Jesus when he said it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Now, friends, that's a very short sentence, but it is loaded and, uh, and it's one of the hardest ones that we, as fallen humanity, uh, have a hard time coming, wrapping our minds around, you know, because I don't know about you, but I love to receive, you know. Uh, it's just a natural default to our nature, isn't it? You know, we, always, we all like to get, and uh, our society is all about, uh, and we kind of nurture that, and our marketing is, is nurturing that and uh, promoting that, that it's all about getting. But Jesus says, yes, there is a blessing in receiving, but of the two blessings... Uh, it is even more blessed to give than it is even to get. And, uh, and so, friends, there's a number of ways that we can give. We can give with our talents. We can give with our, our help, our labor, our words, our encouragement, our support. But, of course, we also give in a material way as well. And uh, so I've been here up here long enough. We're going to say a prayer as uh, we ask uh, the Lord to bless the offering. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to worship you. We thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to know these great words of wisdom that you have given to us through your Son that tells us that there is a larger blessing in giving than there is in getting. And so, Lord, we want to pray, God, that as we consider returning our tithes or your tithes and, and giving you our offerings uh, for your work and for the blessings of others, both for the gospel as well as for the needy, Lord, we want to pray, God, that you will help us to experience that more and more. Give us a spirit of generosity. Lord, help us to, to ask ourselves and to ask you, how much, what is the maximum possible amount that I can get away with giving? And uh, help us to be able to apply that in our offerings and worship before you in church and in every day as we go and we intermingle with humanity around us. Help us to ask ourselves on a regular basis, what is the most I could possibly give to those around me? and then to be generous Christians. And so we prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Now today, instead of our regular children's story, we've got something else planned. We are having a children's dedication and dedicating some young people. I'd like to invite three different families. The Mindoro, the Knudsen and the Bone families, if they would bring their offspring with them and to join us here on the platform. We're going to just have you spread out, try and maintain a little like a football huddle, except there'll be three teams on the field here. And we're going to share some of the um, principles that God gives us in His Word. So now if I have this right, We've got Kyler Mindiro, and we've got Julia Knudsen and Katherine Bowen, all being dedicated to the Lord today. And uh, this is a very special occasion. 
You know, even though there's, uh, life has been disrupted by the pandemic, the work of God goes on. Amen? And last week, we praised the Lord. There were 13 people baptized. And here we've got uh, three young children that are going to be dedicated. And this is in keeping with the teachings of Jesus. You know, the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 2, verse 22, And when the days for their purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him, this is little baby Jesus, up to be presented to the Lord. Now, Jesus was baptized at 30, but its parents dedicated him to the Lord. And this is something I believe is recorded in heaven as a very important event. And the Bible tells us that Jesus loves children. In fact, he said, uh, unless we are converted and we become like little children, we cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And he was much displeased when the disciples said, oh, no, Jesus is too busy to put his hands on the children, to hold them, to bless him. He, Jesus was much displeased. He said, no, that's the kingdom of heaven. I, I love the little children. The Bible tells us that children are not ours. The children belong to the Lord. Psalm 127, verse 3, Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. And you know, it's such a wonderful thing, a joy that even the angels don't get to participate in. God, in love, creates us in His image. And in marriage, in an act of love, children are created. That we become one. And so it's a miracle when you think about it. Uh, at a moment like this, you know, parents are really doing something like what Hannah did. Hannah said, Lord, give me a child and I will give him back to you. And so really, they're God's property that are lent to us of the Lord. You know, I always think about what Joseph must have thought when he knew that he basically was given the stewardship of being a father to Jesus while Jesus was growing up. And uh, this would be the Savior of the world. We're to teach them. Proverbs 22, verse 6, Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he'll not depart from it. And again, some of that is, of course, loving example. Correct your son, and he will give you comfort, and he will also delight your soul. Ephesians 6, 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. The children are to be raised and surrounded by this love for God and biblical principles. And then in Deuteronomy, Moses, when he gives that great command, love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, he then follows up by saying, and these words I command you this day shall be in your heart. You should teach them diligently. And the word diligently there, it means, you know, with great intention, almost to the point of perspiration, Teach them diligently to your children. When you lie down, that's like evening worship. When you rise up, that's morning worship. When you walk by the way, whatever you do, the Word of God was to be put on the doors of the house, on the threshold. He said it might be a sign for your hand, frontlets between your eyes. Deuteronomy eleven nineteen. Teach them to your sons talking to them when you sit in your house, when you walk on the road, when you lie down, and when you rise up. And, you know, there's a very... It, yeah, one of the things that I misunderstood was uh, how quickly kids grow up. You probably heard that before. Boy, I tell you, it happens fast. And you think you've got all this time. It's really a very narrow window. They just, they explode. They explode more ways than one. <laughs> God has a plan for each of our children. And it tells us in Jeremiah 1.5, He has a special plan that He wants to activate in their lives. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. And in Jeremiah's case, to be a prophet to the nations. Psalm 22, verse 10, Upon you I was cast from birth. God has a plan and a director for their lives. And then we want to pray that God surrounds them with His angels. This is something we're doing now. We're committing them to God. We're saying, guard them with your angels. Jesus said, do not despise these little ones, for I say to you, their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. That's interesting. When you think, when you look at your children, you are 
uh, two points removed from the face of God. It says, you see your child, the angels that see the face of God watch over them. It's kind of an awesome thought when you think of it. James Baldwin said, children have never been very good at listening to their elders, but they have never failed to imitate them. And I say this all the time because it's true. Three best ways to teach your children is example, example, example. And uh, they are going to do what you do. And so let them see the love of Jesus in your lives and, and they'll reproduce that. If children live with criticism, they'll learn to condemn and be judgmental. If children live with honesty, or hostility, sorry, they'll learn to be angry and fight. If they live with ridicule, they'll learn to be shy and withdrawn or sarcastic. If children live with shame, they learn to feel guilty. If children live with tolerance, they learn to be patient. If children live with encouragement, they learn confidence. If they live with praise, they learn to appreciate. If they live with fairness, they learn justice. If they live with security, they learn to have faith. If children live with approval, they learn to like themselves. If they live with acceptance and friendship, they learn to find love in the world. And this is a quote that was written by Dor Dorothy Nolte. You know, in, in a, just a final quote, and this is from an article, Review and Herald, 1895. Christ is to be represented in the home circle. Fathers and mothers bear a weighty responsibility for they'll be held accountable for giving correct lessons to their children. They're to speak kindly to them, be patient with them, to watch unto prayer, praying to the Lord to mold into fashion the hearts of their children. But while asking God to mold and fashion the characters of the children, let mothers and fathers act their part, presenting to their offspring a living representation of the divine pattern. God will not accept haphazard work at your hands. Your children are God's heritage, and the heavenly angels are watching to see both parents and children that become co-labors with God in building up the character after the divine model. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he comes, will find so doing. And so what we're going to do now, normally, I would try and hold the children, but uh, because of separation things in, it's hard to hold three at once. Uh, we're going to ask you to kneel. I promise I'll lay hands on them in February. <laughs> it should be safe then. But uh, we'd like to ask you to kneel, and we're just going to have a special prayer, a prayer of consecration and dedication for the children. Father in heaven, uh, Lord, I do think that the angels are smiling down right now as these parents have come to the house of worship and brought their children, recognizing that they are a gift from you, Lord. And uh, every parent feels somewhat helpless when we have the awesome responsibility of raising these children made in your image that have the potential of living forever. Lord, I pray that we'll never lose the sense of this incredible privilege and responsibility. And Lord, that day by day you'll grant these parents wisdom, patience. I pray that you'll have angels that'll be stationed around the children, uh, those that are being dedicated today and all the family. Keep them safe, Lord. And I pray you just guide them uh, in their lives and that when Jesus comes, they'll each be ready to meet you in peace. So, Lord, mark this day in eternity, and I pray that you'll bless these families and bless these children, that they might be transformed by the power of your grace and be your servants. We thank you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. And I think that the ladies back there have some gifts for the families they're going to be bringing up. All the church family want to join in and say we want to be good examples for these kids and families. Amen? All right. Thank you.
just ordinary people. God uses ordinary people. He chooses people just like me and you who are willing to do as he commands. He chooses people that will give him all, no matter how small your all may seem to you. Because little becomes much as you place it in the master's hand. Just ordinary people. God uses ordinary people. He chooses people just like me and you who are willing to do as he commands. And God uses people that will give him all, no matter how small your all may seem to you. Because little becomes much as you place it in the master's hand. Oh, just like that little lad who gave Jesus all he had, and how the multitude was fed with the fish and loaves of bread. What you have may not seem much, but when you yield it to the touch of the Master's loving hand, then you will understand how your life could never be the same. Just ordinary people God uses ordinary people. He chooses people just like me and you who are willing to do as he commands. He uses people that will give him all, no matter how small your all may seem to you, because little becomes much as you place it in the master's hand. much as you place it in the master's hand. Please stand for a scripture reading. We're going to be reading from Exodus um, chapter 2, verses 23 to 25. And it says, Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. Please remain standing. All of the 
of those that are watching online with us too before we have our prayer, our call to, to prayer. If you have a pressing uh, need in your heart, if you have a special petition for the Lord, just uh, where you're at at home, raise your hand and uh, we'll uh, have our call. As far as possible, please kneel. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for another beautiful day of life. And this is not any day, but this is your Holy Sabbath day. The day that we come together, Father, as your children, as your church, to honor and give you the glory for being our creator, for redeeming us, for sanctifying us also, Father. Father, we thank you because we are able to come together and, and openly worship you. And we know that there are going to be times, Father, where this liberty is going to be taken away from us. And so we just ask, Father, that you help us now to appreciate and enjoy the wonderful opportunity that we have to come together as your church to give you and all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. Father, we know that during the last six days there have been many trials and tribulations in our lives, many difficulties that are going, not only personally, but also uh, in our family, in our communities, in our nation, in the world. But we also know, Father, that you are in control, that you, you are sitting on the throne, as we see in Revelation chapter 5, showing us that you have everything under your dominion. We thank you, Father, because we know that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is interceding on our behalf in the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary. And we know that that work is soon going to be ended. And so we ask you, Father, that you help us that we remember that on this Sabbath day, the rest that we have in Christ, that we may learn, have the yearning desire, Father, to want to consecrate our lives completely, wholly, complete dedication of everything that we have, everything that we are, our families, our marriages, our church. Thank you, Father, again for this opportunity. We ask a special blessing on Pastor Doug as he is going to share the Word of God. We ask that you use him powerfully as you have in the past. May you speak in him and through him to us and that this message today may be seared in our hearts and in our minds, and not only to understand it, but more importantly, Father, to live by it. Thank you, Father, again for this great honor and this great privilege that you have given us today to honor and worship you on your Sabbath day. And we ask and we beg these beautiful things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Carlos. Good morning, friends. I want to welcome those who are worshiping with us online. We know we have friends that are watching on a variety of Facebook channels or on um, AFTV, and we're glad that you've chosen uh, to spend this time with us this Sabbath morning. The message this morning is dealing with the subject you see in your bulletin, God Hears His People Cry. Uh, earlier this month, a um, sad event, a friend of ours and uh, many of you who has been bringing music to the church for many years, Max Mace, the founder and leader of the Heritage Singers, passed away. And um, Karen and I were, went up there. They had a, um, an outdoor service. Um, 
You may not know, I traveled with the Heritage Singers. Uh, not that I sang, that's what probably uh, is reassuring to you, but um, I was sort of like a group chaplain, and as we went from place to place, I'd share my testimony, sometimes I'd help maybe with the offering appeal, and then I would do an appeal at the end to invite people to come to Christ. Max said, I want the, the concerts to be more evangelistic, and so off and on for about a year and a half, I would travel with them. We went overseas, Europe, and different places around North America, and, and I remember that they would sometimes sing a song during the appeal, and the song was, Tears Are a Language God Understands. And uh, I'd come out, and I was surprised how many people were moved by that. And they'd just hear the song, and they'd start crying because there were so many people that were going through some trial in their life. And they thought, I'm reassured to know that God understands. God understands my tears. You know, I remember reading that story in uh, Hannah. It's in 1 Samuel, the story of Hannah. She was, the book of Samuel begins with this um, terrible conflict in the house of Elkanah. One wife is tormenting the other wife because she is barren and she has no children. And year by year, she's tormented and Hannah is in anguish. And back then, if you had no children, it's like you were under the curse of God. And what made it worse is Peninnah was constantly provoking and taunting her. I thought, well, she must have really been a difficult person just to delight the person suffering like that. Finally, Hannah could take it no more, and during one of the feasts, she went up to the tabernacle. Eli was not far away, and she started crying and praying. And you read in 1 Samuel 1, verse 10, she was in bitterness of soul, and she prayed to the Lord, and she wept in anguish. And I guess finally God said, I can't take it anymore. Her heartbreak is breaking my heart. And God heard her prayer. Not only gave her a son, which means God hears, but ended up giving her five other children. But it was at the point of breaking, it was at the point of tears, that the circumstances changed. Now, I, I you know, I started looking at all that the Bible has to say about crying, and uh, I was amazed that you find the words cry, weep, or wail over 500 times in the Bible. And I thought, wow, I could do a six-week series on crying. Sounds like I got backup over here also. <laughs> but I thought, no, that'd be a little depressing to do a whole series on crying. Um, but I'm gonna, gonna talk about it because the Bible talks about it. And you know, as Paul said in Acts chapter 20, verse 27, I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. The Bible has a lot to say about crying. And so I thought I'd share a few thoughts with you today. First of all, let me talk to you about the physiology of crying. Humans are the only creatures that cry emotionally the way we do. Now, animals do express sadness and they say elephants actually shed tears when they're sad. But most crying comes from one of two things, physical or emotional pain. You get an irritant in the eye, God's wired us so that the eye begins to release moisture and histamine to help take care of the irritant. Or if you hammer your finger, it can bring tears to your eyes. Physical pain. But the crying we're talking about today is not that so much as the emotional pain. Now, the emotional reasons for crying, it may not always be pain. A person can cry because of anger. A person can cry because of joy. And a person can cry because of sorrow. And you see examples of all of those in the Bible. Just a little trivia you might be interested to know. There's really been no scientific studies to prove it, but 94% of people believe that crying when you've gone through some rough experience can be healing or cathartic. Now, according to a German study on crying, the average woman cries between 30 and 64 times a year. The average man cries between 6 and 17 times a year, which you know, goes along with what our, our uh, traditional views have been. But prior to adolescence, boys and girls cry about the same. You know, I, um, I'm always a few years behind on what's happening with compu computers. 
It's only recently I started texting and I found out how much easier that is sometimes than actually making a phone call. Just text an answer to somebody. And then people would be texting me back the little emojis. You know, the little emotion, the little pictures that kind of say things like that. And so I did it once or twice. I said, you know, that little emoji actually comes in handy. I can just do a, a thumbs up. Someone sends me some information. They want to know if I'm going to be somewhere. I just send them a little thumbs up. I don't have to say anything else. That's great, just a thumbs up. Or someone tells me there's some crisis in a person's life and I got these prayer hands. I say, oh, we'll be praying. So I don't have to, I don't have to go into some long spiel, you know, I just... Well, so I've gotten into the emojis a little bit and sometimes I'll say something to someone I'm kidding I thought well maybe they don't know I'm kidding so I send a little picture of the wink you know and uh, and I, then I began to discover all the different emojis that they've got for just every situation now I got friends I play racquetball with I don't write them and say do you want to play racquetball I send them a little picture of a racket they know what that means they send me a little thumbs up <laughs> and I know what that means and there's all this communication that goes on without us actually ever saying anything through these little emojis. See, I feel real, you know, hip being able to even say that because I didn't know what that was for well, at least until a week ago. But I guess it gets its name because they kind of depict an emotion. You realize that most emotions that people have, we get from God. And I said most, not all. Virtually every emotion we inherit from God. After all, man is made in God's image. But does God ever fear? Who would God be afraid of? Could you sneak up behind God and go boo and make him jump? I mean, could you ever surprise God? So God doesn't fear. And um, God is never surprised. I used to think when I was confessing my sins to God, I'd have to let him know, you better sit down. I got something to share with you. This may shock you. God never feels awe or adoration. Who is he going to worship? So there's some things that we feel that, you know, God's not surprised, God does not fear, God does not feel awe. But the Bible does say God loves. We get that from God. God hates. God can be pleased. God can be angered. Indeed, the Bible says God can be jealous. God laughs. God can rejoice. These are phrases you find in Scripture. God sings. You read in Zephaniah. And yes, it says God cries. Did Jesus ever cry? Was Jesus God the Son? John chapter 11, verse 33, when Lazarus was buried... His sisters finally encountered Jesus and they thought, Lord, if you'd only been here. And when Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in his spirit and he was troubled. He said, where have you laid him? They said, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. You know, that's the shortest verse in the Bible. By the way, a little tip. It's the shortest verse in the Bible in English. The shortest verse in the Bible in Greek is actually rejoice forevermore. Jesus wept. And then you know the one in Luke 19, just before that mount of, uh, on the Mount of Olives, before what we call the triumphal entry, as Jesus got to the top of the Mount of Olives and he was descending, he looked and he saw Jerusalem and his mind was drawn ahead prophetically and he saw the future of that city that was about to crucify its Messiah. As he drew near the city, he wept over it. Folks didn't know exactly what to do. They thought this was a time of great rejoicing. Jesus paused and he wept and he said, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the day of the coming of the Messiah, the things that make for your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will build embankments around you and surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they'll not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus, thinking about the punishment of the wicked and the fate of the lost, he weeps. God does not want to lose anybody. God hears the cry of his oppressed people. God does not like it when somebody hurts his children. I was driving across the mountains a few weeks ago 
and uh, way out in the middle of nowhere, driving across the Mendocino National Forest, and I saw a truck stopped, and since you're way up there on dirt roads and nobody else is around, I stopped, I rolled down my window, and they said, a baby bear just ran up the tree. I thought, really? And I, saw, I, I just saw the tail of it keep on going higher. And so I jumped out of my car. They drove off. I jumped out of my car. I went down. I thought, I want to get a picture of this. And then I realized, you know, where there's a baby bear, somewhere not too far away is going to be a mother bear. And they don't often take kindly to their babies being threatened. In fact, the Bible talks about that. It says you're better off meeting a mother bear robbed of her whelps than a fool in his folly. I've got a couple of friends that were attacked by bears in both cases. Mother bears with cubs. And so, you know, God feels a little bit that uh, maternal defensiveness when people oppress his children. Listen to Exodus 2, verse 23. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, the oppression of the Egyptians. And they cried out. And their cry came up to God because of the bondage. Does God hear our cries? Exodus 3, verse 7, the Lord said to Moses, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry. Now, is there anything God doesn't hear? I mean, God, God hears everything, right? God hears every leaf that rustles in the breeze of every tree in the world. God hears everything because he knows everything, and he's God. So why does he specifically say, I heard their cry? Because there are some things that stand out to him more. And he especially notices that. He says, I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sorrows. Nehemiah 9.9 9. You saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt. You heard their cry by the Red Sea. And in Judges 3 verse 9, When the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the children of Israel. And so, all through the Bible, whenever God's people cried unto him, sometimes they'd cry a little while, but he always heard it. So does he hear your cry? You know, I, uh, I've seen before when I'm walking through the supermarket and a baby cries, instinctively a lot of mothers turn and look. The fathers have developed, it's like living by the railroad track. We don't notice. But the mothers, a baby's crying. And I know one mother told me, and this may be too much information, when she was nursing her children, she was walking through the market, and she heard a baby cry, and all of a sudden her milk began to flow from hearing the cry of somebody else's baby. God just wired us that way where, you know, the mothers feel this defensive mechanism. How do baby birds get their worms? They cry. And she keeps stuff in their mouths they, until they stop crying because the predators will find them if they keep crying like that. Well, God is he's better than any earthly creature or mother. He hears his children when they cry. And he will avenge those who are oppressed. Exodus 22, verse 20, or chapter 22, verse 22. You shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. If you afflict them in any way and they cry at all to me, I will surely hear their cry and my wrath will become hot. See what he means by hearing the cry? My wrath will become hot and I will kill you with the sword. Your wives shall be widows and your children fatherless. God said, if, if you do anything that makes a widow and the orphan cry, I hear that and I will I'll deal with you for that. Luke 18, in that parable where God talks about the widow, you can start with verse 1, he talks about that widow, and she's appealing to the judge for justice, and he's an unjust judge, he doesn't care, she doesn't have any money to bribe him, so he ignores her, but she keeps coming, and she keeps coming, and she keeps crying out for justice. Listen to what Jesus says in verse 7 and 8, Shall God not avenge his own elect? Any elect here today? You know how you become elect? God votes for you. The devil votes against you. You have the tie-breaking vote. If you vote to accept Jesus, you're elected. You become the elect. Shall not God avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? Children of Israel, they were in bondage for a while, but he heard their cry. 
even though the answer did not come right away. Why does God sometimes let us cry for a while before he answers? I mean, Hannah struggled for years before God responded to that cry. He's doing something in us during that time, and you know, we must trust that he knows. Have you ever had to let your baby cry before? If your parents, let me give you a tip, especially if you're young parents, do not put the baby in bed with you every time they cry. Or you will find they're 12 years old and they are still in your bed. <laughs> Can I get an amen? Anybody? Amen. There is going to have to come a time where they're going to be crying because they just want to be in your bed. You're going to have to say, you're going to have to cry yourself to sleep tonight because at some point you need your own bed. So that's one of many occasions where parents sometimes have to let their children cry they're not getting what they want, but he's teaching them something they need to learn. So yeah, sometimes God lets us go through tough times and we're crying. He hears us. And sometimes parents play mother and father. I'm not going to get him. Mother says, no, you get him. You get him. No, oh, you get him. Hear him crying. I can't stand to hear him cry. You got to let him cry. You know, when... Uh, when we hurt somebody deliberately, it hurts God. You don't ever want to do anything to make someone cry unless if it's absolutely necessary. If you're a doctor, it may happen. But um, I don't know if you ever write down any notes from the sermon. If you're a parent, I got three rules for raising children that you can give your children. Sometimes they can't remember, you know, a hundred rules, but here's three rules for raising your kids that I found always work. One, don't do anything that hurts God. Two, don't do anything that hurts anything. You know, if they're drawing on the walls, you're hurting something. Three, don't do anything that hurts somebody, and that would include yourself. And our children, sometimes when they're young, the oldest would find a little bit of diabolical pleasure in tormenting the youngest until pretty soon they're crying. Anyone else have seen that happen before in a family somewhere? No reason other than they were bored and they thought, well, maybe I'll torment my sibling. And they're crying. I used to say, you're breaking a couple of rules. I said, one is you're hurting God because you're hurting someone else that God loves. And then that breaks rule number two, don't do anything that unnecessarily hurts somebody else. It's a good, good rules for life. You know what Jesus said about that? Whatever you do to someone else, you're doing to me. Matthew 25, verse 40, Inasmuch as you've done it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Sometimes we cry over dire prospects. It does not look like the future is good. Maybe you've received a medical report or you've got some bad news. Isaiah 38, verse 1, In those days Hezekiah was sick and near death, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, that means get your will filled out, for you will die and not live. And Hezekiah, he got this news from the prophet, he turned his face towards the wall, and he prayed to the Lord. And he said, Lord, remember now how I pray. I've walked before you in truth with a loyal heart, and I've done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Now, Hezekiah was saved. And sometimes we think, well, you're saved, and you know, if you die and you're saved, you have nothing to worry about. But God's wired us where we want to stay alive. Isn't that right? And, um, you know, I know there's some people, they get to a point in their life, they say, well, I've lived a full life, I'm old, I'm suffering, I'm ready to check out. But normally, we want to live, even in this life. And Hezekiah was that way. And one reason he might have been crying is... Um, he hadn't had a son yet to reign on the throne. So the Bible says God heard his tears. He, God saw his, heard his prayer and he heard his tears. And notice, he sends Isaiah back. Thus says the Lord to David, your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Surely I will add to your days 15 years. And that verse actually rhymes. But... Uh, he ended up then having Manasseh, who ended up being a real problem, but he was later converted in his life. 
God sees our circumstances. He sees our tears and through prayer, crying out to God. He can change our circumstances. In Genesis 21, the Bible tells about when Hagar and Ishmael were sent away from the home because of all the strife that had come into the family. And instead of going to some settlement, she wandered in the wilderness till she ran out of food and ran out of water. And she put down Ishmael, who was maybe about 12 years old at the time. And she got about a bowshot distance because she didn't want to hear him cry. And she didn't want to see him die. And she said to herself, let me not see the death of the boy. So she sat opposite him and she lifted up her voice and she wept. And God heard the voice of the lad. He was crying too, Ishmael. And the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and says, What ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. She, he heard her cry, he heard the boy cry, and he ended up providing water and miraculously took care of them. God hears us cry in our distress. When we do pray and cry to God, the Lord tells us to do it consistently and persistently. You know the story about uh, blind Bartimaeus. You look in Mark chapter 10, verse 46. Now he came to Jericho. This is Jesus' last trip through Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, there was a great multitude. Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the roadside begging. And a great crowd is coming. He says, what is it? What's going on? And someone said, oh, it's Jesus, the teacher from Nazareth. And he knew that Jesus had healed blind people. And when he heard that it was Jesus, he began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now he is crying, he's crying loud. Sometimes I meet people, they feel like they don't have any right to ask God for anything. Bartimaeus immediately believed in the mercy of God and he cried and he cried loud. And when they told him to stop crying, he cried more and he cried louder. Then many warned him to be quiet. They said, you're creating a spectacle. Will you please pipe down these, these beggars, you know? He wouldn't, be, he wouldn't be discouraged. He cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Now, you know what's happening here? What is he calling Jesus? Son of David. Who is the Son of David? The Messiah. Bartimaeus believed he was the Messiah. And so he's calling out, he's calling him the, the Savior, the Messiah. And he's calling for what? He's saying, I deserve it? Or is it, he's asking for mercy. So when we're crying to God, we're in trouble, don't ask for justice. Your little tip, if God should give you justice, you're in trouble. Because what is the penalty for sin? So when you cry out for God, to God, don't cry for justice, cry for mercy. <laughs> I don't want justice, neither do you. He says, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still. Now, did Jesus hear him the first time he called? He didn't answer him the first time he called. He let him go on crying. And so he kept crying. And Jesus called him to come. And he said, Be of good cheer, rise, he's calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and he came to Jesus. Maybe someone gave him a hand. So Jesus said, what do you want me to do? The blind man said, Rabboni, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and he followed Jesus. You know, he continued to persistently cry. It's like that verse we looked at earlier about the widow. Shall God not avenge his elect who cry to him day and night, though he bears long with them? God hears us cry in hopeless situations. Sometimes it looks like there's no way out. I think of the story of Jonah. Those sailors were in a storm and the boat was going down. They threw everything overboard. Jonah 1 verse 5. The mariners were afraid and they cried out to his God and they threw the cargo in the ship into the sea. But Jonah had gone down to the lowest parts of the ship. God heard their prayer and they ultimately had peace because they threw Jonah overboard. Which brings me to another point. God hears cries of repentance. Then Jonah, from the belly of the fish, he prays. And he says, Lord, I cried to you because of my affliction. Out of the belly of Sheol, I cried, and you heard my voice. It's kind of like when uh, the publican went to church. 
The Pharisee said, Lord, I'm glad I'm not like other men. But the publican said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. He cried out in repentance. The people of Nineveh cried in repentance. Jonah finally, you know the story. I'm hoping I'm not spoiling it for you. He ends up coming out of the fish and he marches through the cities of Nineveh. He says, 40 days and Nineveh is destroyed. 39 days, Nineveh is destroyed. 38 days, Nineveh is destroyed. And the people are impressed by this wild-eyed prophet and they think what he's saying is true and they repent of their sins. This whole city that was so bad, God was going to visit them like Sodom and Gomorrah, but they repented. And the Bible said, the king declared, let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let us cry mightily to God. Now, they were about to be judged, so their cry was not a small cry, it was a mighty cry because they had sinned mightily. You must cry out in repentance mightily. And let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and he'll turn away from his fierce anger that we may not perish you know, it's interesting. The sailors prayed that they may not perish. And then here, it tells us that uh, the people in Nineveh pray that they may not perish. And the captain wakes up Jonah and he says, rise and call on your God that we may not perish. Have you heard that phrase before, may not perish? You know John 3, 16? Whoever believes in him may not perish. And Jesus said, no sign will be given but the sign of Jonah. Interesting. Interesting. And the Bible says God saw their repentance. He heard their cry, and he did not send the judgment. David, after he sinned, that terrible sin with Bathsheba, he wrote Psalm 51, and it says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These you will not despise. You know the story of Mary. She's weeping at Jesus' feet. And Jesus said, Her sins, which are many, are forgiven. She goes out from Simon's house forgiven and says that she was weeping at his feet. Sometimes, you know, before you can have a harvest, you need to have tears. You need to water the seeds of the gospel with tears of repentance. In Luke chapter, two, chapter uh, 22, verse 62, Peter, after denying Jesus three times, did Jesus forgive him? It says Peter went out and he wept how? Bitterly. And the first thing Jesus said when he rises from the dead, he tells Mary, go tell the disciples and Peter. Peter's brokenhearted. He thinks it's hopeless now. I saw his tears. I saw him cry. Go tell the disciples and Peter that I'm alive. A thief dying on the cross. He turns and he cries out to Jesus. He says, Lord, remember me. When you come into your kingdom, did Jesus hear his cry? Sometimes we cry not for ourselves. We cry for others. You may have loved ones that you're crying for their salvation. Mark 9, 24, immediately the father of the child, he comes to him and says, Lord, can you heal my son? He says, with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Matthew 15 tells about this uh, woman who comes and she follows after Jesus saying, have mercy on me, heal my daughter. Jesus didn't answer right away. She kept coming. The disciples said, send her away. Jesus said, woman, it's, it's not good to take the children's food and give it to the dogs. I'm sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She cried out and said, Lord, but even the little dogs get the crumbs. And Jesus heard her cry and saw her tears and her daughter was healed, crying in behalf of others. You may have someone you want to fast and pray for, cry for. Sometimes we cry not just for others, sometimes we cry with others. And the Bible tells us, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. You know, sometimes when you see someone else crying, you might be led to cry. It's kind of like yawning. Yawning's contagious. I see it happen in church all the time. Crying can be contagious. Have you ever seen someone crying? Maybe you see it on the news. You see someone crying. You don't even know why they're crying, but their crying moves you to tears. You say, look at the grief in their face. The Bible tells us that um, Mark 9, 24, 
I'm sorry, um, I rather 2 Corinthians is what I'm looking for. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation. Why? That we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. In other words, we empathize with people because we've gone through a hard time. I remember hearing about a person that was in a hospital and they just had this operation, this procedure, and it was painful. And this one nurse came in during her shift and she had to move them around and adjust them and flip things. And she was a little rough and she tore off the bandages and she did whatever she did. And the guy said, man, I was howling. She was so rough, I was in pain. And the next day another nurse came in. And she was so tender and careful and he said it didn't hurt a bit. And as she was leaving the room, he said, I just got to ask you. He said, I, you know, I really appreciate the help and I don't want to complain. He said, but boy, I had a nurse yet yesterday and and she came in and did her thing and I was miserable, I was howling, it hurt so much. She kind of said, I had the same surgery as you. I know how you feel. So does Jesus know how we feel? He came into the world so that we would know that he knows how we feel. There's no way in which you and I have suffered that Christ hasn't experienced. First of all, because he's God and he knows all things. I remember once um, I had a friend. He lost his son in a traffic accident. His only son. And at the funeral in this town, small town, everybody knew everybody. And as they all gathered to comfort the family after the memorial service, and they walked by, I got in line with everybody else, and they walked by the family, and the family was sitting down because they were so overcome with grief that people came by and they said a few words and they, and they uh, you know, shook their hands or gave them a card or whatever. And so I got in line, and finally when I came up to the line, the father looked at me, and he stood up, and he put his arms around me, and he sobbed because he knew we had lost our son a year earlier. And he said, Doug, you know what I'm feeling now. And there was an empathy there because he was crying with me and I was crying with him in a way that, you know, you, you can't relate unless you've gone through that experience. Sometimes we cry with others. You know, the Bible says that the reason Jesus came is to bear our sorrows. Cheer up, we're going to end on a happy note. I don't like talking about crying. Uh, I don't cry very often. I don't want to be around people when I cry. Some people, when they cry, they want, uh, they want group comfort. I don't. I want to be by myself. I want to go off like an elephant, die by myself. I don't, like, I don't like it if you're crying around me. I don't know how to act. I know it's my job, but I'll tell you right now, I feel awkward. And if you're a man and you start crying, I'm going to fold my arms and look the other way because I don't know what to do. <laughs> and a man starts crying. So I don't like this subject, but I think we've all cried before. The Bible says that um, Jesus, before he went to the cross, Mark 14, he took Peter, James, John, and they went with him, and he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. And he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to the point of death. Now, the word cry is not mentioned, but you can be sure that when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was crying. He was perspiring blood. He said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. He was getting ready to be separated from the Father. And you know, some people cry when they're about to be separated from someone they love. No two people loved each other more than God the Father, God the Son. If you want to see a sad story, and actually a happy story, look at when Joseph and his father are reunited. Joseph thought his son was dead. Then he finds out his son is alive. And you see that picture there in Genesis where Joseph gets out of his chariot and he comes and he embraces his father and they fall on each other's neck. And that's something like the separation of the father and the son when Jesus bore our sins. And then the, reun the reuniting during the ascension. So Jesus experienced that. You read in Isaiah 53. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, 
and afflicted. Well, you know, I'm glad that the, the Bible and the gospel does not end with sad tears. It ends with happy tears. John 20, verse 11, And Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked inside the tomb, and she saw the two angels in white sitting, one at the head, the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had laid. And they said, Woman, why are you weeping? She said, Because they've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they've laid him. You know, when you've misplaced Jesus, it's cause for sorrow. Mary and Joseph misplaced him when he was little. It says, We have spent three days sorrowing, searching for you. Sometimes you maybe have gotten distracted by the world and you've misplaced Jesus. They've taken away my Lord and I don't know where they've laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around, she saw Jesus standing there. But her eyes were so full of tears, she didn't know it was him. She did not know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She had heard that phrase before, Woman, when she was washing his feet, and maybe she was the one caught in adultery in the temple. She's supposing him to be the gardener, and technically she's right, he did plant a garden eastward in Eden. She's supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. And then Jesus said, Mary. She recognized that voice that had cast out those seven devils before. She turned and said, Rabboni, which is to say teacher, and threw herself at his feet. Did he hear her crying? You know, Mary had spent a lot of time weeping at Jesus' feet, even as he hung on the cross. There she was, weeping at his feet. And now at the tomb, she's weeping once again. He sees that, and he reveals himself to her. You know, Jesus says in Luke 6, 21, Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Yeah, we have, weeping may endure for a night. You know that verse? But joy comes in the morning. Revelation 21, there's going to be a resurrection morning. And the Bible tells us in verse 3, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there'll be no more pain. The former things have passed away. You know, I'm so thankful that God can take our sorrow and turn it to joy. This is the promise of Scripture. I want to share with you a story. The story is about 30 years old, but it bears repeating. March 18, 1991, this is a press report. Tuesday, February 28, 1991, was for Cecil Carpenter and his ex-wife Ruth Dillow a day that they will never forget. Cecil, a sewage plant operator in Humboldt, Kansas, was at work when the phone call summoned him to the city hall. About the same time in the nearby Chantier town of Kansas, Ruth was called from her sewing machine at the National Garment Company and she was ushered to the boss's office. A grim vision of two men in uniform awaited them both. They didn't have anything to say, said Ruth, her voice still trembling. When you see this, you expect the worst. The worst was what they got. They were informed that the previous day, just two hours before a ceasefire was declared in the Persian Gulf, their youngest son, PFC Clayton Carpenter, 20, a tank mechanic with the 1st Cavalry Division serving near Kuwait, had been killed by a cluster bomb. Suddenly, for both Cecil and Ruth, the world went blank. It was all a haze, said Cecil, 53. I know they talk about their regrets, said Ruth, 46, but I just fell apart. He was dead. Those were the only words I remember them saying. Separately, they felt the same desperate grief. Cecil spent a, ceaseless, a sleepless night haunted by painful memories. The next day, he sought solace with his and Ruth's older son, Shane, who was 24, as well as with family friends. Over tears and quiet laughter, they shared stories about Clayton, a light-hearted, affectionate boy with a mischievous wit. As the hours passed, a stream of friends and neighbors came with flowers and cakes, plates of meatloaf, casserole, home-baked bread. Sympathy cards filled the mailbox. Small town, everyone knew everyone. Down the street at Johnson's General Store, they put up a wooden plaque in memory of Clayton to pay tribute. They put red roses and black ribbons and cards. Ruth at her home sat in the living room 
friends and relatives came and left. She got into bed and hoped to sleep. She got out of bed restless. I kept looking at his picture framed on the wall. I kept saying, no, he can't be dead. This has got to be a mistake. Still, when the phone rang late that evening, Ruth wasn't quite prepared. The far-off voice that announced, hi, Mom, this is Clayton. Ruth froze. Are you sure this is Clayton? She blurted. You've been declared dead. Her mind is racing. She thought someone was playing a cruel joke. Come on, please believe me, Mom. This is me, he pleaded. He was calling from a hospital in Saudi Arabia and explained he had been lightly wounded in the foot and in the hand, but he wasn't dead, he insisted. Still incredulous, Ruth asked, What did I call you when you were little? Clayton panicked for a moment. He couldn't remember. Then it came to him. Oh, yeah, little garbage disposal, he said. He had always had a voracious appetite. That was all Ruth needed to hear. She started to shake. Her boy was alive. Back in Humboldt, when Clayton got the word of his survival, delivered that night by two red-faced army officers, it spread through the whole town. Within minutes, everybody seemed to know. The streets were jammed with cars as joyful visitors all arrived to join in celebration. The next morning, Cecil marched to Johnson's store. They dismantled his son's memorial plaque and they had an impromptu parade with hundreds came to the town square. They tossed the wooden plaque declaring his death in a garbage and set it on fire along with the roses and black ribbons. Clayton said, please hang on to the condolence cards. I want to know what it feels like to die. <laughs> Cecil said, I don't know what it would have been like without all these people. But the whole town turned out for a parade complete with this band playing the Star Spangled Banner. The great rejoicing. Can you imagine going through that? Um, being told your son was dead for 24 hours and then finding out they're alive. The Bible tells us about uh, the stories of the sorrow being turned to joy. Isaiah 35 verse 10, And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing and everlasting joy on their heads and they will obtain joy and gladness. You know, when I travel with the Heritage Singers, another song they used to sing, one was, Tears are a language God understands. Another appeal song we had was, He washed my eyes with tears. Some of you may know that song. He washed my eyes with tears that I might see. The broken heart I had, I could sing it, you'd all cry, I promise. <laughs> the broken heart I had was good for me. He tore it all apart and looked inside. He found it full of fear and foolish pride. He swept away the things that made me blind, and then I saw the clouds were silver lined. And now I understand it was best for me. He washed my eyes with tears that I might see. You know, there's a world coming where God promises he's going to wipe away all the tears from our eyes, and there will be no more sorrow, no more weeping, no more pain, and no more tears. In this life, Jesus said, you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. And I look forward to that day when God will wipe away our tears. Now, some of you who are either here or watching, uh, the Lord only knows what you may be going through or the sorrows that you bear. I want to assure you, you do not bear them alone. The Bible promises Jesus sees your tears. They are a language he understands. But you need to call out to him, cry to the Lord, and he can turn your bondage to liberation and he can replace your sorrow with joy. We're going to sing together. Those who are watching online, you, you want to download this. It's 485 in the Adventist hymnal. I must tell Jesus. We invite you to sing with us. We stand here as we sing and uh, Jolene will come out and lead us. Then we'll close with prayer. Jesus, I must tell Jesus. 
Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. He is a kind, compassionate friend. If I but ask him, he will deliver, fix up my trouble. sadness and sorrow and crying and weeping in the world and in the Bible but God sent his son into the world that he might ultimately wipe away all of our tears of sadness now there may be tears of joy when we get to heaven and rejoicing but um, whatever your tears are take them to the Lord the Bible promises he sees and he hears when his people cry amen Father in heaven, we're, we're thankful that you are a loving, compassionate, empathetic God, that there is no sorrow in this world that you do not see. Indeed, there's no feeling that we feel you do not feel, you do not know. I pray that we can find comfort in that, Lord, whatever our struggles are, our doubts, our trials, whether they're tears of pain or sorrow for others, that we can bring these to you and that you are a God that does hear. You can change our circumstances and ultimately dry our tears. Lord, I pray you bless each person. We kind of uh, spoke in general terms today and we'll all need to know how to apply uh, these principles to our lives that we might find comfort in the truth of your word. So bless each one, Lord. And most of all, I pray that you be with us during these difficult times we're going through, that we can find uh, comfort and strength and even joy through the trials of life. We thank you. We pray all this in Christ's name. 